among us listeners. This is Dennis Hayes, Derek's dad. Derek always has a story for everything he says. And to let everybody know, I know about 90% of everything he says I've heard before. I've known about it. So he's not just making up stories. He's telling you what he's heard and done. And he's actually done all this stuff. Thanks, Dad. A good evening and welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. And welcome back to this, your 12th installment of the 12th season. And I have a swell little show lined up for you guys this evening. We have monsters, ghosts, cults, alien abductions, Mexican witches, and a lot more. All waiting for us on the other side. So... Let's not keep them waiting. To kick this evening off, we make our way to the bottom of the world. At least, from my perspective. Please join me in welcoming Kim, from Australia, to the program. Hi Derek, hi everyone. My name's Kim and I'm from Cairns, Australia. And this is my friend's story about her Yowie encounter. So last year in March, she bought a motorhome and she went to travel around Australia. But then COVID hit, so she set up camp at my dad's house, which is south of Cairns. Um, He lives at the base of a mountain and he's on about two acres. So I was working from home at the time. So one morning she came in pretty shaken up and she told me that the most frightening thing happened to her last night. She reckons that she woke up sometime in the early morning and she heard footsteps approaching her van and like twigs breaking and she was trying to listen. She was listening real close and she's trying to think if it was a person and she was leaning more towards like a wild pig or something and we don't have bears or anything here so the most ferocious you're going to get is a cassowary or a, or a wild pig. It got closer and her windows were open so she could hear it quite it was quite close she thought next it was my dad but there's no way that he would be out there at her camper van at night that's just real sus so she heard heavy breathing get closer and then she heard like low grunting and she was terrified and it it hung around for a bit and she just laid there frozen she wasn't game to look up and see what it was Eventually, it just trailed off into the bushes. She heard it walk away. And obviously, she asked my dad if he was outside at night. And obviously, like, he wasn't. There's no reason for him to. And, yeah, I, I straight away when she told me, I was like, yep, definitely a yaoi. I'm such a big believer in it. And I'm obsessed with, you know, listening to people's stories. So, yeah, that that's my theory. It's a yaoi that live up in the mountains behind my dad's house. The thing about Cairns is... There's a lot of sightings up here and there's Facebook groups and people share their experiences on that. Um, Cairns isn't a big place, so people talk and if you talk to any of the local Indigenous people, the Aboriginals, they will always have stories about the hairy men, Um, so it's very common here. I think that when Cairns was colonised, it was built in between the ocean, like where the Great Barrier Reef is, and the tablelands so the tablelands are like a region higher above sea level you got to go up the mountain to get there and as we built in cairns we pushed the yowies up into the forest between us and the tablelands because there are so many sightings up there and stories yes that's what i reckon 
and yeah it'd be great to hear other people's stories if anyone else is from the Cairns region or Queensland love the podcast and have a good day everyone see ya thanks Kim I love a good Yowie story now for those not familiar the Yowie is essentially Australia's Bigfoot or I guess Sasquatch a tall bipedal human like ape that is said to roam the bush in the outback. Now there are Yowie hunters, just like there are Bigfoot hunters here in the States, and they too collect evidence. Witness reports, cast footprints, hair samples, and even audio evidence. The following was recorded from the bush in a recording device left for several months by Yowie hunter Jason Heal. Now imagine yourself holed up in a small camper at the base of a mountain and you hear that in the middle of the night. And perhaps that is similar to what Kim's friend heard that night. But I couldn't help but notice that Kim listed a known critter that also makes similar deep grunting sounds. She mentioned the existence of feral hogs in the area. Well, as my dad vouched for in the opener, I have inside knowledge for just about everything. And I do for this as well. I actually grew up raising hogs. My family raised and slaughtered several over the years, and I spent a majority of my preteen and early teen years in and around the neighbor's much larger hog operation. The point being here that they're intelligent animals that can also make a strange array of sounds. Now those unsettling sounds come to us from a boar, a wild boar, and they come courtesy of Ian Fairley on YouTube. So could that have been what Kim's friend heard that evening? A roaming boar sniffing around the yard. That's certainly an easier pill to swallow, both as a skeptic and someone that's probably hoping there's not some eight-foot giant creature in their yard. But I will say it is worth noting that the stories persist. The sightings continue and the legends continue to grow. So something is feeding that growth. And before we move on this evening, Kim mentioned something that caught my ear. The discussion of Aboriginal peoples of Australia having stories about the Yowie. While that may be true, there certainly aren't many examples of it in video form. I did some serious digging and came up nearly empty. Now perhaps it's a cultural thing. Perhaps the stories just simply don't exist. Or perhaps, and most likely, no one has taken the time to capture these stories. But despite a lack of Aboriginal Yowie stories in digital media, I did find one tale that I got a kick out of. Back in 1986, I was driving near Kempsey in New South Wales in Australia, a remote country town which is surrounded by hills covered in very thick forest. An Aboriginal man was hitchhiking back to his campsite. I gave him a lift. He was very grateful for the lift as he had been waiting on the side of the road for over an hour. He told me how his uncle had gone fishing at a creek in a spot that took an hour to walk. It was very isolated. It was a hot day. He soon caught two big fish. Then he went to sleep in the long grass on the bank of the creek. He was suddenly woken up by a noise. He stood up and a yowie was crouched down by the creek and drinking water only a few meters from him. He startled the yowie who had also jumped up and stared in surprise. His uncle punched the yowie in the stomach, then he ran off as fast as he could leaving the fish and fishing bag behind. I asked if his uncle described the yowie and he replied no. The man also said his uncle claimed the yowie had a soft stomach, not hard. I presume the uncle had his experience in the 1950s. Now that one was courtesy of Bigfoot Case Files on YouTube. 
and was practically the only Yaoi story I could find from the aboriginal perspective. And quite the story it was. And thanks again, Kim, for sharing your incredible entry. Now I have some fun and exciting news. Thursday, December 23rd, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, we're going live. And that's right, we're bringing back the holiday special. And this year, I think we have all the kinks worked out. So again, that's 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on the 23rd of December. Links will be provided ahead of time. And per usual, we are featuring listeners like you. So if you have a spooky, true holiday season story, hit me up with a summary at monstersamonguspodcast at gmail.com. And maybe you will be featured. And we have guests and prizes and all sorts of fun things, so be sure to stop by. For more information on that, just listen to upcoming episodes or be sure to follow us on social media. So then, our next entry might just teach us all a little lesson. Here's Rob from the UK. Hello Derek, this is Rob again from the UK. I just wanted to tell you about a bizarre experience that happened to me. This would have been in May of 1991. I was living in Cambridge at the time and I was traveling back to Cambridge after visiting my mum. Um, I'd visited my mum's house, which was about 20 miles west of Cambridge. Just shortly after leaving my mother's house, I was driving back to Cambridge, heading east. The sky was very overcast. So there was a lot of light being reflected off the clouds and, and things like that, which will lead me to what I'm going to tell you about in a moment. But I was dri- as I was driving along, I saw something flash past my window on, on the driver's side. So I glanced up at the sky and after a few seconds, I saw another light flashing in the sky, then another and another. And what gradually became apparent as I was looking out the window was I was looking at an enormous pinwheel of light that was rotating, it was a huge circle, and it was following my car. It was the most bizarre sight. The lights were concentric, they were kind of going into the middle, then coming out again, going into the middle, coming out again, kind of pulsating, changing colour. So I continued along the road for a good few miles, I would probably say six miles, and I got to um, a roundabout called the uh, Caxton Gibbet, um, which is an appropriately spooky place. It's a location where they allegedly used to hang highwaymen and other other criminals way back in the day. And uh, an an actual replica of the of the gibbet, of the actual gibbet, there's a replica of the of the gibbet, is still there. I mean, there's a McDonald's there now and a petrol station. It's it's quite a big area now, but it's still quite an odd sort of spooky kind of place. Anyway, as I got to this roundabout, there was a truck driver pulled up and two or three other motorists pulled up. And we were all staring at this light that was circling over our cars, over our vehicles. And the truck driver, I'll never forget this, he turned to me and he said, that's got to be a UFO. And we were looking at this thing and the the lights were going in and out and pulsating and changing colour. And it was was, was absolutely enormous. It was about the size of a football field. So I got back in my car started to head back towards Cambridge and this thing started following my car again. So I'm driving along, I'm looking at this thing and then gradually I became aware that lasers were coming out of the bottom of this object, heading towards the ground. And now, by this time I was starting to get really freaked out. I thought, this is just really weird, now what's going on? Continued down the road a few more miles and then I noticed that the lasers were getting brighter, they were gaining in intensity and they seemed to be focused in on a particular area of, of the ground. And then it suddenly dawned on me what I was looking at. In Cambridge in May, it's the graduation party for all of the Cambridge University students. All of the universities have what's called a May Ball. And for these May Balls, they have fun fairs, they have bands, they have all kinds of things. And it turns out what I was looking at was a laser light show that was projecting from the ground up the, onto the low cloud. You know, the cloud ceiling must have been fairly low, you know, perhaps a few hundred feet at best. But this thing was visible from miles away. So I'd essentially been driving towards this laser show, but it had looked like a UFO that was following my car. Um, the optical illusion that this thing created was was just amazing. And the thing that puts me in mind of this was one of your guests uh, mentioned looking at a pinwheel, mentioned seeing a pinwheel UFO. 
and that reminded me of my experience uh, back in the summer of 1991. Um, it even made it onto the news the next day because people apparently had been phoning in saying they'd seen this object in the sky that turned out to be uh, uh, strictly terrestrial in its origin. Anyway, um, I love the podcasts. You know, thank you for all of your hard work, all your editing and all your research that you do. We really all enjoy them. And, uh, and I, I look forward to eagerly to every episode. So I hope you enjoyed this and I hope it made you chuckle. And uh, I'll perhaps speak to you again sometime. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Rob. And for all the U.S. listeners out there, here we call a gibbet a gallows, if that helps paint the scene. Now, we've recently featured a very similar sounding video on an episode of Paraweekly, my bi-weekly paranormal news show over on YouTube. I was certain then that the UFO was too some sort of promotional spotlight. Some of those things are quite intricate in design. And I don't think it's any secret that I enjoy calls like this. Sometimes it's just fun to get a final conclusion to some of these mysteries. And we all know that they can't all be paranormal. So thanks again, Rob, for sharing that little experience. Now, if you have a true paranormal story you would like to share on the show, simply call the hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-6444. Now, our next terrifying tale was sent to us from an anonymous caller from the codfish state. Hi, Derek. Well, I wanted to call in and share my story. So I live in a one-family house, although it's kind of like two because the basement has been made into an apartment, and my mother lives down there. So over the weekend, well, actually on Monday, my mom came up and talked to us and said, did you guys have company over last night? And we said, no, my husband and I. And we asked why. She said, um, I think this was Friday night. She said she woke up at like one in the morning or so. She sleeps on the couch in front of the TV and her computer is in that same room. So she said she woke up around one in the morning and saw somebody sitting at her computer like a kid, like a teenager, and another one kind of standing in the doorway next to the stairs that actually lead from the basement into the main part of the house where my husband and I stay. And she woke up and saw them there, and she looked at them. They noticed her, and then they just kind of got up and just kind of slowly walked back up the stairs into the main part of the house, which is where my husband and I are. So we thought that was odd because we didn't have any guests over. We don't know any teenage kids. There's no signs of anybody breaking into the house. She said nothing was missing. Uh, We also thought it was odd that of all the computers that there are in the house, I have a computer, my husband has a computer, that they would go into the basement specifically to use her computer. So we said, no, there are no guests, uh, no signs of breaking. And she says, well, I know I'm not crazy. (laughs) And I know she's not either, but I just thought that was interesting. So thank you, Derek. Um, I'm a big fan. I've probably been listening to your show for about a year. I think you do a great job. I think the people who call in are extremely interesting. I love your show. I'm a Patreon. But yeah, keep up the good work. Thanks, caller. There's a first. A spirit using electronics. A computer, no less. Now, it's details like that that makes me wonder if this isn't more of a time slip situation rather than a ghostly one. Was our caller's mother witness to the past? Or did she get a glimpse into the future? Regardless, it's a wild tale, and we appreciate our mystery caller sharing it. Now for this next entry, what do you say we stay in the Bay State? Check out this one from Patrick in the state of Massachusetts. Hey Derek, my name's Patrick. I'm calling from Massachusetts. I'm from a small town outside of Boston called Arlington. It's about seven miles outside of Boston. So it's a small duplex that we grew up in. There were six of us, including my four siblings. We had a dog, and there was only three bedrooms. So I used to sleep on a mattress in my parents' room on the floor. My brothers shared a room, and my sister had her own room. So this was back when I was probably eight years old, seven years old, and I would definitely be awake. Like, I know for a fact I was not sleeping. 
and I would roll over on the mattress and I'd look over at my mom's bed because the way I was positioned was right next to their bed. I look over and I'd see my mom sitting on the end of the bed with her legs crossed and she was just smiling at me, but with like a, like a sinister smile. It wasn't like a normal smile. It was like this deep, huge grin, ear to ear, smiling, the biggest she could smile. And the scariest part was that I'd look over and I'd see my mom sleeping. I'd see my mom with her sleep mask on sleeping and there would be her sitting at the end of the bed, two versions of my mom, one of them with this creepy smile. So what I'd do is I'd roll over on the other side, I'd throw the blanket over my head and I would just close my eyes and pray and you know, eventually fall asleep, never turning my head over and looking again until the sun came up. So this would happen you know, relatively frequently when I was a kid. You know, My parents didn't really believe me, imagination they'd think or whatever, dreams. But I remember another time, so it would only be my mom. I remember another time I got up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom and I left their room. And to get to the bathroom, I had to pass my brother's room. And both my brothers were sleeping in there. It was the middle of the night, we were kids. And uh, the door was open to their bedroom as it always was. And I saw my brother sitting on the end of the bed, legs crossed, smiling at me. And then I saw him laying in bed. It was two versions of him. The real him sleeping, I could see his face sleeping. And then I'd see this like, for lack of a better term, doppelganger sitting on the end of the bed, smiling at me with this like sinister, evil looking smile. So I booked it back to my parents' room, got underneath the blanket, threw it over my head, you know, laid there until I fell asleep eventually. So it stopped happening. And, you know, I searched everywhere to see if anybody else had an experience like this. I could not find anything anywhere with anybody having a similar experience. That's the reason I'm calling. I was hoping that maybe somebody listening to this might have a similar experience or, you know, know what, what the hell was going on. So thanks, Derek. You know, I appreciate everything you do. Love the podcast. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Patrick. That's for all those doppelganger fans out there. Now you think the traditional experience is creepy. Poor Patrick was left seeing double. And what's with the grin each doppelganger had? It's very Indrid cold ask of them. No, it's great stuff, Patrick. So maybe a few listeners out there have had a similar experience. Perhaps in time, we can shed some light on this mystery. Thanks again for taking the time to share. Now folks, the holidays are fast approaching. And I heard that Monsters Among Us gear is on many wish lists this year. So head on over to monstersamonguscom forward slash shop to pick up something sinister for that amongst her in your life. We have all sorts of items, but might I suggest a perfect stocking stuffer. Pick up one of several poster designs, and remember proceeds from each poster sold goes to the Navajo Water Project, a nonprofit aiming to bring clean water to America's most in need, beginning with our friends at the Navajo Nation. Oh, and did I mention that I personally autograph each and every one of them? Or just treat yourself with a membership to Monsters Among Us Beyond over on Patreon. Four bucks a month, 50 plus episodes, patreon.com forward slash Monsters Among Us podcast. And now, time for another dip into the ghostly realm. This is Sarah Jane from Parts Unknown and a slight trigger warning for the mention of suicide in the following call. hey My name is Sarah Jane. That's my first name. Don't worry about it. And uh, I just wanted to call in. My friend Eric encouraged me to. He's the one who actually introduced me to your podcast. But I um, wanted to call not about my own story, but about my uh, grandmother's. So it was about 20 years ago in the autumn, and my grandmother went over to her friend's house. I don't remember where exactly it was. Uh, I thought it was in Manhattan, but I may be wrong. But she went over there with her friend, Joan. And my grandmother slept on the couch and Joan slept in the bed with her. And she was sleeping and she heard running footsteps charged towards her. Like someone was running right at her and it woke her up because it was running from across the room. It woke her up and she felt a hot gust of air jump over her and there was a window behind the couch. She felt it jump over her and, like, vanish through the window. She didn't make much of it. She just kind of thought, you know, whatever, maybe I'm having a bad nightmare or something. And the next day when she woke up, she 
told the woman who, it wasn't her friend, it was her friend's friend that had brought her to that house. So she told the woman and her friend that she had felt this, like after she heard the running footsteps, she had felt the hot gust of air go right over her and vanish in the window. And the woman started crying. And she had said that it was like right around the time of her son's birthday. And he had died, I think it was like a year or two or three years ago. He had like lit himself on fire and had made a running charge and jumped out the window and had, uh, I can't remember, if, yeah, there, like, it was a couple stories up. So I think he fell to his death while he was on fire, but he might have just ended up burning to death after he fell out the window anyway. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. And hope it helps and <laughs> happy holidays. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Sarah Jane. Don't worry. I won't. I gotta say, that story is worthy of the silver screen. It's exciting, terrifying, and there's development, and the entire story is wrapped up well. Well, as well as any of these could be. It's something of a classic ghost story. We thank you, Sarah Jane, for sharing your grandmother's experience. Now, did you guys check out Para Weekly last week? Well, it'd be a lot cooler if you did. Those that did will notice I do a segment that features videos from viewers like you. So if you have something spooky on video you would like us to take a look at, you can send that over to contactparaweekly at gmail.com. And be sure to tune in. New episodes every other Friday. Now then, this next one comes to us from a unique perspective. Please join me in welcoming Michael from California to the program. Yeah, what's going on? My name is Michael. I'm from the Bay Area, California. I'm here at work listening to your podcast. And, uh, I served six years in prison, but when I was in county, one day I was looking out my window, which was normal. Me and my cellie were talking, looking out our window, you know, talking about the past and the families and stuff like that. And I'm sitting down looking at this star. And like, just as soon as I seen the star, I'm looking at this thing and out of nowhere, this thing moves in the blink of an eye, just out the way. I, I got so scared, I jumped off the top rack, hit the door, it was shaking. My hair's on the back of my neck stand up and my belly is freaking out, telling me what the hell is going on. That was just, it was amazing because it was a star in place. You could see it, it was huge. And just in the blink of an eye, it was gone. It wasn't gone, it moved so fast. And uh, just how scared I was, you know, my belly, we started looking out the window every night. I, I, matter of fact, for three nights, I didn't sleep by my window. I slept on the opposite side. Yeah, you guys can make whatever you guys want from it, but that was my story. That's the craziest thing I saw in the sky, so, yeah. Thanks, Michael. Now, I certainly don't blame you at all for freaking out in this situation. You're trapped, no escape. If something were to happen, on an extraterrestrial level on the outside. You're locked away, a sitting duck. So I get it, I would probably be a little freaked as well. But as far as the object is concerned, I'm not aware of anything that can move the way Michael described this object moving. It almost sounds otherworldly. Thanks again, Michael, for taking the time to share that entry. Now you'd think at this point we'd be wrapping it up, but I have a lot more we need to get through. Stories from a darkened Texas road. Stories like Sarah's. Hi, my name is Sarah. I live in Central Texas. This experience happened to me about a year ago. So one night I'm driving home from work. I work in a restaurant and we close at 9.30 at night. I live about 35 minutes from work. I live out in the country, so I'm about a half hour drive from basically anywhere in town. So I'm driving home and I'm starting to get close to the road I'm gonna turn down to head to my house. So to get to my house, you'd be driving down the main road. It's not a highway, but the speed limit is 65. Since you're out in the country and everything is spread out, you wanna drive faster, I guess. Anyway, you'd be driving down the main road and right before you get to my turn off, you would go over a short bridge and then the main road would curve around while going up a hill. 
Then after the curve, you would see the road you could turn off onto on the left, which would be my turn off. I hope that made some sense. So I'm driving down the main road after work. I'm almost to the small bridge. It's probably around 11 p.m. now since the restaurant I work at closes at 930 and it takes about an hour to clean up after closing and then about half an hour for me to get home. So around 11 at night, I'm approaching this small bridge. It's a pretty small bridge made out of concrete that goes over a creek. The bridge is probably only a few hundred feet, so you're not driving on it for very long. Anyway, I'm approaching this bridge and as I'm coming over it, something hits the right side of my car near the back. Right before it hit, like split second right before it hit, I saw a white blur. It startled me pretty good since it made a pretty loud noise when it hit. And it did hit my car, not my car hitting it. It hit the right side of my car near the back. I'm not sure of exactly where it hit on the car because it didn't leave any marks, which is one of the things I thought was kind of strange. So anyway, I'm driving over the bridge and something flies into my car. Like I said, it startled me, so I hit the brakes but like not hard enough to stop the car. Remember, it's 11 at night and I'm just a girl, so I wasn't sure about getting out of the car, especially on a bridge where the speed limit is 65 and I could cause an accident if a car was trying to avoid hitting me. So I hit the brakes enough to slow down a little, but I kept the car moving. My brain is going crazy though with what that could have been. My first thought is alien UFO since I'm into that kind of stuff and because birds don't really fly around at 11 p.m., but I also figured there's probably some explanation on what just hit my car. The white blur I saw was probably a bird, even though it was nighttime. So anyways, like I said, I slowed my car down, but I was still moving and approaching the curve in the road I mentioned in the beginning, that's right after the bridge. The whole time I'm still driving, I'm thinking about the thing that hit my car, like was it an animal or what? So I'm still driving around the curve and I can see my turn off up ahead, but I'm just too curious. So I use my turn off to turn my car around and I head back to the bridge. This whole time I haven't seen a single other car on the road. So I'm back at the bridge and I'm still a little bit spooked about getting out of my car and walking around on this bridge. So instead I slow down to like a crawl, probably not even 10 miles an hour and very slowly creep my car along the bridge. I've got all my windows rolled down so I can see better and I'm looking at the sides of the bridge where I'd imagine that the animal would have fallen after whacking into the side of my car. I mean it hit my car pretty good so I'd imagine that whatever hit was either dead or seriously injured. But I didn't find anything. I drove up and down the bridge twice and like I said, it wasn't a big bridge. It was just flat concrete with concrete walls on either side for safety. So it's not like the injured animal could have just crawled like over the side of it after falling unless it could make it up that concrete wall. But I mean, I did keep driving for a minute after it hit in my car. So maybe it had enough time to crawl all the way off the bridge and into the grass. But it was literally like just a minute before I decided to turn around and have a look So I'm not sure if an injured animal would be able to move that quickly. I really don't know. But anyway, I had driven my car up and down the bridge at a crawl and didn't see a thing. So I decided to head home. Once I got home, I investigated my car. Like I said earlier, there were no markings on the car, not even a scratch, no blood or feathers stuck anywhere, which seemed really strange to me. Um, Because I've seen the aftermath of my dad hitting a pretty good-sized bird with his truck. So I know that stuff gets left behind on the vehicle. But maybe not this time since it hit my car instead of me hitting it with my car. It hit hit my car. So maybe it didn't leave anything there. Um, I'm not really sure. The next day, I went to hang out with my mom. And I told her the story. And she thinks that it was most likely an owl which would make sense since it was flying around at night. But if it was, then I mean, shouldn't the impact have killed it? It hit pretty hard or at least left it laying injured in the road for me to find when I came back to look. Maybe by luck, it wasn't badly injured and it flew off, but I don't know. But I can say that my car was hit by a UFO since I never figured out what hit it. And that's my story. So. I hope you found it interesting, and I'm a really big fan of your podcast, so thanks for listening. Thank you, Sarah. 
Now the odds are really good that your mother is correct. You probably hit an owl. From the sounds of things, maybe a barn owl. And I say that because they are white or light gray. And they live in barns, overhangs, and places like bridges. Now it's likely the bird was stunned when it struck the side of the truck. It had come to its senses and flew off before Sarah made it back to investigate. Now I can hear many of you now, but I'm not debunking anything here. Just adding a little bit of rational thinking. And just because the creature in question might be an owl, doesn't mean it can't be something supernatural. Now I received this call from an anonymous source around the same time as Sarah's entry. Hi Derek, I'm calling from Texas. According to Mexican lore, there's these big owls with human faces called lechuzas, and they claim to be witches. People that can turn into an owl. Sounds crazy, but that's Mexican lore. And where I'm from, also from Texas, once when I was about 17, I was outside with my mom, and my neighbor from across the street came up and said, did you see that? And we're like, no, well, what are you talking about? And he said he was outside in his backyard smoking a cigarette, and from across his fence, he could see a tree, and in the tree, he saw this huge owl that was cackling and laughing and laughing. And he knew that the lady next door to him was an older lady who was really, really sick, and he said that he could hear this owl laughing and laughing, and he claims it was a lechuza who never saw anything, but he said that he started cussing at it because, according to the legend, you're supposed to cuss and curse at it to get it to go away, and he started cussing and cursing, and that it flew away. Don't know, never saw it myself, but that's what he claims, and... Also, my grandmother had told me a story of a friend who was really sick. She had some sort of rash all over her body, don't know what it was. And she confided in my grandmother that at her window, a really huge owl, she also called it a lechuza, was there laughing at her and mocking her and telling her to scratch and scratch at her rashes. Don't know, but that's just a story that I was told. Well... I really love your podcast. Thank you. Bye. And the funny thing is here, this is not the only Lechuza call I've received. And as far as I could tell, each and every one of them originated from the Lone Star State of Texas. The state in which Sarah also had her experience. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Interjecting a little common sense doesn't always have to kill the magic. Hell, in this case might have amplified it. Thanks again to both the callers in that package. Alright, ladies and gentlemen. Wait until you get a load of this next story. And I hope you're sitting down. Please welcome our next anonymous caller from New Jersey to the program. My name is... I want to remain anonymous... And here's my story. I had been newly engaged to a young man and he took me to a dealership to look for a car. And the family that owned the dealership was extremely wealthy. I noticed that the the gentleman, the young gentleman who was probably like mid 29, 30, couldn't take his eyes off of me. It made me feel very uncomfortable. Okay, I was engaged. A Couple of weeks later, I'm in this club with my girlfriends, didn't drink. And there's two levels. I'm on the second level, and I see these three men come in, dressed in suits. They had like a glow about them, and they seemed to be doting on this one person. And somehow in my mind, I knew that was the man I had seen at the dealership. So I I ignored it, and I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, I felt this burning charge go through my back, like from head to toe. And I turned around. And I saw this vision of a giant galaxy out in outer space. Now, this was pre-Hubble, and I had never imagined or seen anything like this or didn't know anything about outer space, aliens, nothing. And I became so frightened. I just became shuddering. And this man came to me, and he said, did you see what happened when I looked at you? And I said, what was that? And he said, that's the galaxy I come from. 
and there were two other gentlemen with him, and the one gentleman had started reading my mind and talking about a friend I had who was a professor. He said, I know your friend, the professor, from this small town in Peru, and he literally named the town, and I'm freaking out. So after that, I was like, you know, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm so scared. I'm so scared. I just kept shuddering. I told him, yes, I'll call you. I'll call you, even though I was engaged, but I had no intention. And the following weeks, I was so frightened to go back to my apartment because I just felt like somebody was watching me. And I kept saying to myself, it's in the sky, it's in the sky, it's in the sky. Then after that, there was this cascade of years of bizarre experience. Let's fast forward now. I talked to somebody who is famous, I'll leave him nameless, who was an alien hunter and he was with the CIA, and I spoke to him about everything and told him everything that happened to me subsequently, like losing a pregnancy, uh, an embryo disappearing in my body after I got married, you know, all these other bizarre goings on. And he confirmed everything I had gone through. And then miraculously, strangely, the email address I had for 10 years was wiped out of the site. And I kept going in, they said, no email such as this exists. My correspondence with this alien hunter just completely disappeared off the map, and it was extremely freaky. And I just knew that everything I had gone through was real, and it's frightening beyond any imagination you could have in this world, and totally true. I am sane. I have never been treated for mental illness. I have no medical conditions. This really, really happened. Okay, another part of this alien piece. Later in time, I found out like I was maybe six weeks pregnant. And in a couple of nights, I found myself waking up and it was not a dream. There's a difference between a dream and an experience. This was an experience and I was in absolute agony. And I opened my eyes and these people in surgical garb were around me, but they were not people. They had these giant black shiny eyes they looked Asian and I was like stop please no you're hurting me and I looked down and I saw this black oozing liquid all over my abdomen and it's funny because years later I saw the Travis Walton movie and he described some black oozy stuff and that was what was all over and this is before that movie came out and when I looked at this one creature with the surgical cap he gave me the most evil look like he was enjoying hurting me and it was horrible so anyway lo and behold a couple of days later i go to get an ultrasound and they tell me that there's no baby there there's no evidence of a placenta there's no nothing everything's gone and i'm not pregnant it's completely gone and the doctor was baffled by this And within a day, I got the worst abdominal infection with the 104 fever, where he said, if you don't get well over the weekend with this antibiotic, go to the emergency room immediately. So whatever went on, I'm telling you, they took my fetus. There was no evidence of it. That was one of many experiences. It sounds bizarre, but I've had so many experiences because I tend to be psychic and see things ahead of time. I'm very intuitive. So one really strange thing is I had gone to Florida to a convention at Disney and it was at um, an old sort of a replica of a 1930s hotel and in the front of the complexes there were these lagoons. The minute we got there that night I started freaking out. I was like, I want to go home. I want to go home. You've got to get me out of here. This place is horrible. This is Devil's Island. I've got to leave. And the people that ran the convention were like, you know, thinking I was crazy, like all upset, like, what is she talking about? And I was like, no, you don't understand. This place is really bad. This is horrible. Well, the next few days I spent complaining, huddling in the room, saying, we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. This is a very bad place. You can't be here, blah, blah, blah. Lo and behold, my son took it upon himself to get us tickets to leave two days early from the convention because of all my complaining and apprehension. So we leave. The next week, the little four-year-old boy that was killed by an alligator, it was right in front of the rooms that we stayed in. 
I imagine that that is what was provoking me to have these horrible feelings that we have to get out of here. This happens to me very often. I'm really psychic. You know, I see things that happen in the future. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. And I literally experience it. It is like not like people describe. It's not a dream. It's an experience. And I have many, many more that have all come true. Well, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thanks, caller. Now, allow me to be frank for just a moment. Some calls just sound crazy. Bonkers. Unbelievable. But what concerns me is when one of those wild stories comes from a normal-sounding, credible witness like our caller. It's spooky because it takes one of the logical explanations away. We then have to assume it's not something like a mental illness causing hallucinations or the like. But if you break it down, what she's saying isn't all that far-fetched. People have experienced that sense of doom that seemed to be a precursor to some sort of danger. People see men in black type figures, which I can only assume was the figures described in her experience. And people even have strange visions, even of the galaxy and the universe. Though admittedly, not all these at the same time. And of course, our caller's claims of stolen fetuses. That's another experience we've heard before. The phenomena even has a poster child of sorts. Alien abductee, Geraldine Orozco. I became pregnant and I got pregnancy test positive. Next thing you know, I have a miscarriage and there's no fetus, there's nothing. Geraldine had been pregnant for eight weeks when she miscarried. A fetus should have been visibly present. Every time I would become pregnant, I would have a miscarriage or a miscarriage where there wouldn't be a fetus. The fetus would be missing. When I would see the doctor, and I saw different doctors over the years, they wouldn't know how to explain what had happened to me. Geraldine claims that aliens actually presented her to her alien human children. And as I'm looking at these children and I see what they look like, they're not all the way human. This gray, thin skin a much bigger head and these giant eyes that are so deep and so profound and so complex. It was just incredible. But what I recognized as I'm meeting the child is that it's my child. At this moment, Geraldine realized why she could never get pregnant. She believed she wasn't having miscarriages. Her unborn children were being stolen from her womb and mutated with alien DNA. Now that clip was part of the Discovery Plus show Alien Witness with Ben Hansen. And although the mention of stolen fetuses in regards to alien abduction isn't extremely popular, Geraldine Orozco, Betty Hill, and dozens of others claim it to be true. In fact, they even have a name for it. They call it hybridization. While thousands of abductions are reported each year, a small percentage claim it's for something known as hybridization. Hybridization involves experiments with reproductive organs, leading many victims to believe they're being used to crossbreed with alien life forms. That clip from the same program as the previous. And might I add, one of the better UFO-based television shows to come out in recent years. So I guess this all leaves us asking the question, if all this is true, why are they doing this? The possibilities are as endless as they are terrifying, and almost begs the question, do we really want to know? Thanks again, caller, for sharing that nightmare fuel. And that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is provided by Sarah Carter Hayes and Addie Lloyd. All audio used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. And join us over on social media. We have accounts at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you have the ability and a couple spare moments, please leave us a five-star rating and a nice little review. You have no idea how far that goes to help the show grow. And finally, the terrifying score that you heard this evening was provided by Co.ag Music and Carl Casey and White Bat Audio. Thank you so much for listening. And until next week.
Now I know some of you are going to absolutely love tonight's secret entry. For others, it'll probably have an adverse effect. So let's find out in which camp you belong. Welcome to the program, Mystery Caller. Um, what's going on, Derek? I just started listening to your podcast, man. Big fan. Love getting creeped out by stuff like this. Um, I've actually got a story that took place in uh, Columbia, Alabama. There's a place that was right down the road from it that me and a couple of my buddies and their girlfriends and a girl that I was actually talking to at the time, uh, we went to a place called Columbia Manor. Basically, it was just like this little, I don't even know how to put it, kid's place that little kids go to get scared. We were just bored, so we figured we'd go try it out. Well, it ended up being a huge waste of money, and uh, we ended up actually leaving there and thrill-seeking for something else. So we had gotten told about this place, a little dirt road, that supposedly had a satanic worship spot on it. And we ended up going down this dirt road. It was me, my buddy, like I said, and my other buddy, they actually went home at the time. So it was just me, him, and and two girls left. And of course, me and him wanted to be big ballers and act like we weren't scared of anything. So the place that was in the woods, you actually had to climb a barbed wire fence to get to it. So me and him went first, of course, and they kind of stayed back behind us a little bit. Whenever you climb the first barbed wire fence, we actually had flashlights on, and if we wouldn't have flashlights, uh, we kind of would have been screwed because they had bear traps, like, I mean, everywhere. Like, there was just a row of bear traps surrounding this place, and it was kind of crazy because, I mean, we don't have bears in Alabama. So we were stepping over the bear traps, making sure we didn't hit anything, get caught up in any of them, because if we would have done that, we'd have been done, we'd have been goners. I mean, it's the middle of Alabama. There was no service where we were at. So, I mean, we were kind of already freaked out, me and him were, but we didn't We didn't really let it get to our heads. We didn't want to act like we were scared in front of the two girls. So we kept on going, and there was a little building out in the middle of absolute nowhere in this field. And we went inside this building because the door was open. There was no lights, and we shined our flashlights on the walls. And on the walls were actual porn magazines, like naked women magazines, taped all over the place, broken CDs, just where it, when the light hit it, it would just blind your eyes for how many CDs there were on the wall. And it, it was actually really like kind of creepy. And in the middle of it, there was like, I guess you could call it like, you know how like a church has an altar spot, like right in the middle? There was an altar spot, but on the altar spot, there was a skeleton of a dead cat. And you could tell it was a cat. I mean, just because I have a cat. I mean, I've, I've buried cats before. I've seen their skeletons, and I knew that this was like just a regular house cat. Paige, the girl that I was with at the time, she actually stepped on a nail in the floor and screamed. And when she screamed, we heard something at the back of the house just rustling around. So, of course, me and Dylan go to check it out. And this was before I could uh, open carry or could still carry. I, I didn't have a gun with me. We had no means of protection whatsoever. And we peek out the window of this place. And in the back of the, of the, I guess you call it a backyard, it wasn't really a yard. At the back of this place, there were people in black cloaks and they were abnormally tall. Like, just, I mean, stupid tall. It was actually kind of crazy how tall they were, and that scared me a lot. And they were dancing around the fire, and one of them had a chicken in their hand. And they were dancing. They weren't, like, like hip-hop dancing, like, breaking down. They were, they were, like weird kind of traditional dancing just around the fire holding hands speaking a really weird language we could hear them from the house and that scared us even more so we got out of there and we start running and everybody's running making sure we don't trip over the bear traps all kinds of stuff and as soon as we get back to the car it was like this beam of light just comes straight up out of the ground and i'm talking about there's a curve that this place leads into and I'm talking about we didn't see any type of headlights coming around the curb. I'm talking about this thing just appeared out of absolute nowhere. And as crazy as it's going to sound, there was a yellow, it was a Miata. I remember that clear as day, and it gives me goosebumps to this day. I'm, I'm scared to death. I will not go back there. But uh, this, this Miata, he comes up, coming around this corner, and it was just like he literally just came out of the ground, man. I mean, like, just as fast as speed of light comes out of the ground. And he almost hits my friend as he's pulling up. So my friend, of course, gets pissed off, runs up to the car, acting like a badass out of hell, and ask him, he's like, he's like, man, you need to watch where the F you're going. And this dude lets down his windows. And when I tell you, I'm talking about pure shivers running down my body when I saw his face. His eyes were just like gaping black holes. And he talked to us 
at first he was like mumbling a language I didn't understand and I was trying to be a hard ass at this point because I didn't know what the hell was going on and I said excuse me and he he said y'all need to get the f- out of here and y'all do not need to come back and we listened to him because he just looked like the pure and devil and it absolutely scared the bejesus out of me so um this was around December of 2016 I'm 22 years old now and I have not been back to that spot nor Columbia Manor nor anywhere near there so yeah man huge fan of your podcast keep up the good work I love that you have this platform where people can just tell all kinds of crazy stuff and not be judged for it I'm really glad that you actually stepped out and done this unlike all the other podcasts I've listened to got tired of listening to Dateline so I hopped on here appreciate it man have a good one Thanks, caller. Now allow me to point out from the start that trespassing is never a good idea. Trespassing while armed is only half as smart. It's a terrible idea. Now all preaching aside, what a terrifying experience. It's one thing to stumble upon a scene like this, thinking whomever is responsible was recently there. That thought's enough to drive one mad. But it's a whole nother situation to then realize that they're still in the vicinity. And I think it's safe to say it becomes a much more dangerous situation, even without the addition of bear traps and suddenly appearing vehicles. And just to save myself a few emails, there are a few black bear in the state of Alabama, although they are limited to the southeast corner of the state. So something tells me whoever set those traps didn't do so for the bears. But I'll leave you all with this final message. I'm certainly no expert on cults or ritualistic ceremony. But if you stumble across sacrificed or mutilated animals, please call the fuzz. Even if it's just an anonymous tip. Thanks again, Galler, for sharing that entry. It's certainly a heart-stopping series of events. And a big thank you to you for sticking around to the end of the show. Have a good night. 